Hey everybody, it's uh, Rothbard's Disciple here. It's been quite a long time since I've made a video. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of the reasons was I was really hoping that, uh, or I was doing a lot of work on my end trying to promote an app that I've been trying to make for a long time. And I thought I was getting some places with it. Um, it seems that the developers on the Bitcoin SV side, they have completely different visions from me um, in terms of how to gain adoption of Bitcoin SV. I think they're dead wrong in their approach. Uh, just so you guys know, the two approaches is, or the approach of uh, Bitcoin SV for promoting Bitcoin is they're trying to just slap Bitcoin on top of other apps that have already existed. So they're basically like they're the MetaNet, uh, the way Craig Wright envisions it. It's basically like the internet, but just run on Bitcoin. Um, if you got like you know James Belding's tokenized system, it's stocks and bonds and whatnot, just with Bitcoin tokens. You know, movie tickets with Bitcoin tokens. Um, and primarily all the things that they're doing, they're high value transfers with uh, either transferring Bitcoin itself and the high, it's a high value because there's enough Bitcoin transferred or they're transferring, you know, tokens that are of a very high value as well um, in terms of stocks or bonds. Um, and this, I think, is a real big issue because uh, from the consumer standpoint, there's absolutely zero reason to believe in any version of Bitcoin right now because none of them have enough natural throughput to pay the miners, okay? So the miners are getting murdered right now, and the miners have been getting murdered. And, you know, this is one thing that I keep trashing Bitcoin SV for or their community for is the community keeps saying, like, ha, 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 look at the miners, they're getting murdered. And as far as long as miners are getting murdered, that means there's no reason anyone should use Bitcoin because it's not secure. Okay, and so then the approach that Craig Wright and all of his, you know, the people who work for him are going with is, uh, you know, we have no, or we, the consumer already has no reason to believe Bitcoin is secure and they're trying to have the consumer put all their highest value transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's mentally retarded and it's fucking backwards. And I've gotten really hard on these developers and that's part of the reason why to a large extent they ignore me now. A lot of them have me blocked, whatever. Sort of irrelevant to me because they're the ones who have to make this work. They're the ones who will have scammed investors. It's their reputations at stake. I've already made my case, you know, and if they don't listen to me it is what it is. But um, it, it, it just gets, it gets a little bit frustrating specifically because, again, they're pushing all these high-value transactions on users, but why would the users trust this, okay? And so th their main problem is that they don't actually have any new use cases for Bitcoin. All they're saying is, yeah, Bitcoin be, can be used to do things you already do, but it'll be slightly better. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to work because you have to reach that critical mass where people accept it before that you know, you'll get enough use case just out of normal transactions. And I think they've got it all completely backwards. Um, and I think they're going to kill the coin, to be honest. That's my honest prediction on this. Even though if you take things like, you know, James Belding's tokenized software, that's a, it's the best fucking wallet I've ever used in my life. But if I can't do anything new with it, then what's the fucking point? You know, why are we creating all these apps when we don't create anything new? And so I'm going to show you guys this app that I've been trying to show to these developers. It's super simple. It can be work on any of their tools. Um, beyond that, uh, like, like it's really I easy to implement. Um, so it, it, this isn't hard for somebody else to do. Um, they just have to do it and understand the concept, and they don't really understand the concept all that well right now. So, I, like I said, um, actually I haven't said that this yet here on YouTube, but um, I started relearning coding a little bit, it was about three weeks ago actually. And I've already coded the app, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so I've, I've, been I've been asking these developers to do it for a year and a half, and the, the one reason I'm bringing this up is I, it, I'm reaching a point now with the Bitcoin SV crowd that I, I'm pretty sure they're going to fail, and I'm pretty sure they're going to completely fucking fail because there's no room for argument in that group. There's no room for argument in any groups within any version of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. They don't ever argue. That's like the one thing you can't ever argue against the people inside the group. And it's mentally retarded, especially understanding that you can fork coins. It's like if you guys really disagree, just fucking just fork off, you know. Um, but nobody lets anybody disagree, and, and it really boggles my mind. So, again... 
I, I'm really believing that Bitcoin SB might completely fail, and I want to really explain this because I can do this on any other coin. I actually, when I first came up with this idea and started talking about it, the person who I got the most or the best response was from was Porman Insom of Zcoin. Okay, and Zcoin's my favorite altcoin. Um, and it might actually be my favorite altcoin over Bitcoin SV now because I all I've seen Bitcoin SV do is ignore everything I tell them, and then they fuck up and they fall flat on their face consistently. And then they, after they fall on their face and they stand up and their nose is all bloody, they're like, "Oh, I meant to do it." <laughs> it's like shut the fuck up, you fucking idiots! Like we are like the Bitcoin SV crowd is like we're a joke, to be honest. We're a joke. What we're accepting as, you know acceptable from from who we've got um, and a, a lot of it too is a lot of people think that Craig Wright is Satoshi and they think that's a really good thing if Craig Wright is Satoshi that's terrifying because if he fucks up we all lose okay and it, it looks like if you watch what he's doing it looks like he's not making very many good <laughs> good decisions he you know didn't really win the hash war we have two versions of Bitcoin he said it would never happen you know, the other thing about Craig Wright, and this is the other thing that I hate about all the people who are involved in the creation of applications within Bitcoin SV, is we don't actually have businessmen. They're all academics. Craig Wright is an academic. He's not a businessman. And you can tell this really simply. Um, like, if you've ever read Ayn Rand, um, she has a she despises intellectuals. I'm very, I have a very similar viewpoint to Ayn Rand. Um, I despise intellectuals as well because, like, all they do is they write papers and they don't create products for users and if you guys remember you know back in the day when Craig used to not block me all the time he would retweet retweet a lot of the videos that I made and uh, I asked him you know I, I was talking about this app that I'm gonna show you guys right now I was talking about this and I said hey this is this is the weapon I need for for this war so give me give me a sword and I'll fight for you and then he says like oh yeah hey well we need to build weapons for these guys you know build this guy a sword and uh, it's like here we are over a year later and he's done nothing <laughs> and I you know again he's got so many people working for him they could easily done something like this but they don't and all that Craig does again he's written something like 500 fucking papers and he's written, read something like a thousand books it's like that doesn't help the user you know Craig Wright is through and through an academic and I despise academics he's like my favorite academic and if you've actually read like Ayn Rand if you've read um, Atlas Shrugged I can't remember the name of the academic in that book but there's one academic that she likes but she like sort of likes him but sort of despises him at the same time that's my view on Craig Craig is the one academic I like but I still hate the guy because he's an academic and I just wish he would build products rather than write fucking papers because he's written hundreds of papers I still can't fucking use Bitcoin for the simple apps that I've been asking him to to build uh, still can't do it I'm no closer to doing that those fucking papers do absolutely nothing for me so just so you guys know, I'm going to, or when we look at my program here on the left side, um, for those of you who actually code, it might look sort of ugly and whatnot, but um, if we're looking at this here, uh, basically the way it works is that I create a bunch of programs, and that's what all of these, where it says, you know, DEF and then a program name, that's me defining a program and what the program does. So I create a bunch of programs, and then I put them in a GUI, and they all do things within this GUI. Um, the other thing you have to know is there's also uh, within my file that has all my coding in it um, there's also this tweet file um, this is important because it's actually what stores my tweets so these are all my tw my tweets that I've written I can actually come in here and alter this and that would actually not be good and so obviously uh, this app that I'm building it's not like something that's finalized at all this is just a proof of concept um, but this is where the tweets go and again I can alter these tweets right in here and that'll mess up with how my program works so if you were actually doing this you'd want to create a file that like a user can't really get access to or something and I'm not entirely sure how to do this yet um, I, like I said I started relearning how to code three weeks ago and I took two different computer science classes that had a bit of coding in them and I could not do even one quarter of what I'm doing now 
again, I hate academics and the way, like if you ever try to learn coding at a college or if you try to go through some sort of class, the way they teach you, it's mentally retarded. They try and teach you to master each individual aspect without really teaching you how it works as a whole. Um, so I'm actually later on, I'm going to show you guys how to build this and I bet a lot of you could build this or similar applications like it. And like I said, this application I'm going to be showing you guys, it can be altered for the creation of anything digital. The one that I'm creating is for things like uh, Twitter specifically, but you can do it for things like YouTube, you can do it for things like Pandora, Spotify, Steam, you know, video games, whatever it is. Anything digital, you can create an app like this for it. Um, and I'm going to show you guys how to do this. Um, but when, or I'm going to show you guys how to do this in later videos, not in this video. In this video, I'm going to show you what the app does, okay? And so when I start this, the first thing to know is that. Uh, this is a, an absolutely shitty GUI. My GUI coding abilities are really pretty poor. And I'm using something, if you look at this code, um, I'm using something right at the top here called TK Enter. And I was told that TK Enter basically sucks and not to use it and to learn something else. But I wanted to, to get this video out, out as soon as possible. So I decided to learn how to code what is in the background first and then just do something simple and TK Enter and then learn how, like, learn the ins and outs of a better um, GUI program at some other point. Okay. Um, so. What does this do? That's the first question. Um, what does this GUI do? Well, we said before uh, we actually have this tweet file, right? So this is the tweets that all uh, or all the tweets that we've tweeted. If we look at this, um, the last two of them, it's a bunch of Z's and a bunch of X's. Um, that's the tweet file as it's saved right now. Um, this top box here, and again, I know this looks like shit. Each one of these boxes does something different, but this top box is for tweeting things out. So if I want to tweet something, you know, we'll just say sample tweet. Um, sample tweet one, I can press tweet and it disappears. So you might be like, what happened? It disappeared. Where'd it go? Um, well, technically speaking, the way the code works, I didn't actually send it anywhere, but I copied the tweet and I put it to this notepad. So again, every time I tweet, it's saving this tweet. Now, if you guys remember what I've been talking about for um, these applications, I've been saying that need to be built is that all, all you do with a Bitcoin application is you save data usually locally on your own computer and then later on you'll hash it in, in special ways like it, it depends on what the data is the way that you hash it and what you hash together and you'll create a Merkle tree and you'll post that the root hash of the Merkle tree to the blockchain so as you can see here these what these tweets actually represent are the tweets that I have not yet put on the blockchain okay so these are tweets that I'm gonna need to hash and I'm gonna need to put the root hash on the blockchain Okay, and the whole reason that we're going to do this uh, with your tweets is because there, there's two versions of Twitter right now that exist. There's the Twitter version of Twitter, which um, when you tweet something, uh, for some reason, even though you are the creator of the digital content, you know, when you tweet something, you created that tweet. Somehow, Twitter gets 100% of the intellectual property rights of that tweet. You know, there's nothing stored to the to your own computer, and Twitter has a right to completely censor it and delete that data into an oblivion. And so, some people spend years on Twitter building up a reputation, and then Twitter censors them off, and it's just like years of years of their life down the drain and they have no record or a record of it whatsoever and so what this will do uh, by storing the tweets is it allows the user to keep uh, control of their intellectual property rights now on the other flip side what you have is uh, something like uh, memo and memo they say they're like an uncensorable version of Twitter but it costs a shitload and there's absolutely zero privacy so like if you post something on memo talking about how you hate communists and then later on communists come into power and they look back at your old memos and they see that oh you used to hate communists well we're gonna kill you it's like that's kind of a bad thing you know what I mean and th th there's like a million reasons why you don't want people to have access to all of your information in a raw way that memo does but memo still does it the way they do. I've said this before and I still think it's true. Um, I think what Memo does should be viewed as a virus and I think it should be criminal. Okay, I think, you know, I think it's Jason Elliott. Whoever it is who's behind Memo, I think they should be, you know, threatened with jail time because it's, I think it's a serious crime and I'm not joking. I understand that they're doing it because they're ignorant of what they're doing, but it's still a serious issue. And this, this goes back to why, like, again, a lot of the people in this community, uh, a lot of the developers I work with, they don't, like working with me to a large extent because I don't like to lie to them and I 
like for this, I've said it to their faces. I've said I've told Ryan Charles. I've told Jason Elliott. Um, I haven't said anything specific to whoever Unwriter is, but all three of them work on applications that put raw data to the blockchain, and I think people who do that should be should go to jail. Like that is an unbelievably risky thing, and the only people who would ever actually want to do that are people who are doing illegal things like spreading child pornography. Um, I don't know why anybody does it, but again, for for this like Twitter, we don't ever want to put these tweets directly to the blockchain for two reasons: it's expensive as fuck, and uh, the second reason is there's no privacy to the user. So you anything that you put to the blockchain, um, you lose property rights in it so you don't ever actually want to put a digital good on the blockchain you put the hash of a good because when you put something on a blockchain like you can keep your intellectual property intact but if you put digital content on the blockchain you lose the property rights of that digital content and so th th this is the one thing the one concept that I can't get anyone really to understand is that what the blockchain is good at is allows you to extract IP which just means you separate the intellectual property from the digital good and you 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 utilize both of them in different ways okay um, um, but anyways, yeah, so I can add sample tweets to this. We'll show it again. I'm going to put, I'm going to write something really deep and philosophical. You guys can ponder the meaning of what this tweet means on your own time. I just, I just like to challenge my viewers sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, you know, anytime I press tweet, I reopen this with notepad. And I know there's probably some way to automatically open this with notepad. I don't usually use Windows. I've only been using Windows for like a month now. I used to use it years ago, but I quit using it for a while. But again, the tweet's still here. So as you can see, anytime I tweet onto this, uh, it goes to um, it goes to the tweet file. So that's great. That's really great. It all seems to be working, um, or that all seems to be working fine. So what are these other um, buttons do, and what are these other things of text? Like, as you can see, I can actually write text in here, but if I write text in here and display tweets, um, obviously it, it's displaying things on the screen. It's not taking my text. So that's not what this button is for. This button shows me all those tweets. So if we if we open up that tweet file after pressing this button and we check them against each other, it allows the user to see the tweets, which again, if we're storing um, on something like this, on this notepad, maybe you don't need to do this, but you, again, like I said, you don't want a person actually ever altering this file, the tweet file that we have stored. You can alter this button all you want. You can go yeah, da 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 da. Press enter again. No matter what, wherever the bottom line is, you know you're you're getting all the tweets that you're supposed to have here. Okay, so that you want the user to interact with this here. You don't want them to interact with the notepad. So it actually is good to have this display tweets thing up here. And again, anytime I want to tweet anything, if I want to tweet a bunch of numbers, it's fine. We go down here. We got everything here. It adds it to it right there, right away. And again, this isn't something that like, this actual GUI application, um, since you're only using this to help create tokens you're, you're only going to create a um, something that you're going to put to the blockchain you know, every once in a while, because again, we're storing a bunch of tweets. We have a bunch of tweets here. Um, let's say we store them for you know, a month. So you're going to store all your tweets for a month, and then you're going to hash it to the blockchain, or you're going to hash all those tweets together into a Merkle root hash, and you're only going to put that root hash on the blockchain. And again, the reason why you do this is it keeps your costs low, but if you actually look at a root hash in a Merkle tree, um, each one of the individual items you put in that is contained in the root hash. So by putting the root hash on the blockchain, you've put everything else on the blockchain. So if you go back to what Memo does, it's like it makes absolutely no sense to do what Memo does for the simple fact that you can do it for an exponentially lower cost. You know what I mean? And so if you can do it for an exponentially lower cost, why aren't they doing it? Um, it makes absolutely zero sense. And there's, you know, it obviously gives you the privacy as well. So these other buttons, um, all they're going to do is they're going to visualize what happens when we are creating our Merkle tree. One thing to notice for this Merkle tree is that uh, each one of these levels of the Merkle tree, you can go from the root um, down all the way to the leaves. Um, but the leaves, there's 16 leaves, and then the next level up, there's eight uh, or eight hashes, and then it's four hashes, and then two hashes, and then one hash. So each level that you go up, um, the number of hashes that you're left with is divided by two. Okay, so if we uh, go back and we look at all the tweets that we have here, display the tweets, um, it looks like we've got quite a few. 
I think it's above 32 right now. So uh, if you multiply from 2 and you keep multiplying by 2, if you have more than 32 tweets, that means our bottom layer, um, it has to have more than 32 leaves. So 2 times 32 is 64. So that means we need 64 leaves on our bottom layer. So this is important because if you look at our tweets, like we've got a bunch of tweets here, but I don't think that we have 64. So the way that we actually get around this is uh, you, when I say display unhashed leaves, all this means is I want to have um, each one of the unhashed leaves. So if you look at this Merkle tree, each one of these leaves before they're hashed, I want to see what they are. And like we said, we have to have 64 of them because it has to be a multiple of two. Um, or, you know, two to the x, two to the power x. And... Uh, how do you do this? Well, all, all that we do, if you look at this, I'm just adding the number one um, if we don't have enough uh, enough tweets. So if, if, our, if our number of tweets isn't a, a multiple of two to the power of x, then we just add a bunch a bunch of ones to the list and then that become or that fills up the rest of our Merkle root, okay? And so again, you don't have to explain this to a user, but I'm just explaining it to you guys so you guys understand how this uh, application works. Now, if you look at this, I do display the leaves of the Merkle tree. So the displayed leaves of the Merkle tree, we're actually going to look at this uh, here. I have a little hashing tool that works for um, Microsoft. It's just ha called Hash Tool. It's a real nice free app. Um, but wh when I made this GUI, um, I made it specifically so that it could be used with uh, Microsoft's uh, hashing tool here. Um, so I can copy straight from uh, on my GUI. Uh, just hit Control C. For some reason, I can't right click on the mouse. That doesn't work. Uh, but I hit Control C, hit Control V on my hash from list. Ooh, actually, I don't want to copy the hashes. Sorry. I was copying the wrong list there. I want to copy the unhashed leaves because we're going to check to see if our unhashed leaves have come out to the right hashes. Okay, so if we go here and we look at the start, uh, the first line it's 2336 something something something. That's the same on the left side as well on our GUI. The next line's 3E 2363. That's the same. Next line's 83398 that's the same and you can go down through this whole thing and it's all the same um, all the way through um, you guys can check that individually if you want the next thing that we do um, and again sometimes it's actually useful to check these things manually if my list had fewer things in it then I would just I would do that but my list has a lot of things in it so um, I'm not going to manu manually go through and hash each one of these. The next button that we have is display the levels of the Merkle tree. So if the leaves of the Merkle tree um, that we have here, well, I'm actually going to get this back up here. If the leaves of the Merkle tree that we have, are right here, okay, the hashed leaves, if this is our bunch of hashed leaves, um, if we look at our Merkle tree, we have to combine these and we have to get uh, the next level of the hash tree, correct? So the next level should have half the amount that the first level has. And uh, um, we have 64 in our first level, right? So our second level should have 32. Um, this it, we're, It's actually level 1 is what we're calling it because we're calling the first level just the leaves of the tree and we're calling this next one level 1. That might not be the academic way. Again, I'm self-taught and I really can't stand academics or learning from them. So if my words are wrong, that's fine to me. If my definitions are wrong, that's fine to me. It's the concept that matters. But again, we should have 32 in level 1, 16 in level 2, um, 8 in level 3, four in level four, two in level five, and one in level six. So if we look at this and we go down this, um, I'm not actually going to count these all straight out, but that looks like it's probably about 32 for level one. Level two, if we look at this, it looks like it could be about 16. Level three, if we look at this, we can actually count this up now. That is eight. Okay, so level four. We got the four hashes, level five. We got the two hashes, and level six, we got the one hash. Um, the one thing that we got to make sure too is that uh, you know every time we change this, all of these, or the or any time we tweet something new, the level six hash should change because, like we said, the level six hash contains all the hashes contained in, in the levels below it. So if we tweet something new, 
we would expect that to change and wow this was not the best way to delete that I was deleting that from the wrong side but let's go up here tweet Darth Vader because why not display the levels of the Merkle tree and look at that level six the first one started with something like 11 C or some shit like that this one's 8 C so they're obviously not the same so it's working and again if you guys want to manually check this out you can copy paste the code put it in, in Python uh, idle um, whatever save it save it as a program run it and you can check it all out yourself um, it does work I've already checked it extensively um, but again, this the the whole point about this is uh, this saves a huge amount of trouble for everybody. And the reason and how it saves a bunch of trouble for everybody, um, it's very simple. Uh, all that all that it does is like like let's go back to when the Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV split, right? Do you guys remember Ryan Charles? Uh, he got in a lot of trouble because when he was using uh, or his his website yours.org. Um, they censored some people, right? So they censored quite a few people. And the problem with this was that uh, when they censored them, like all their content just completely got deleted. If you did something like these Merkle root hashes, um, it allows you to censor somebody but without destroying their content because, again, you're separating the intellectual property from the digital good itself. And so you would have some sort of contract between uh, like yours and the posters, and it would, say, hey, it would say, hey, we have the right to censor you, but if we do censor you, we're going to send you back all your content, and we're going to send you back the content that we have hashed to the blockchain so far, and that's what we're required to send you back. And so then they can do that, and each party fully has their rights uh, respected and guaranteed and you can still censor people you can still say radical things and nobody's gonna stop you and this is this is the whole point about this and this goes for not just for Twitter or things like yours.org which are sort of social social media sites it goes for anything that is created digitally anywhere and this is really what we need to get on top to or what we need to get on top of um, and again I, I'm having a lot of trouble getting any developers on top of this but like I said I'm gonna show you guys how to code everything I coded here. Um, I'm not going to show you guys how to code the GUI because I suck at GUIs, but I'm going to show you how to actually code. Well, I might show you a little bit of the GUI just so you know. Um, but I'm going to show you specifically, you know, what is behind the code here because that's actually the really, the more important stuff. Um, and I, like I said, I learned all of this super quick, super quick, super easy, and I think the reason why is the angle I approached it from, so I'm going to see if I can get other people to learn it um, as quickly and as easily as I have, but I, I hope you enjoyed this video, um, if you made it this far, thanks a lot, uh, but uh, there will be more videos coming out soon.